Oh, I'll never be loved, my baby. Not the way that I love you. Through, through, through and through. Oh, I'll never be loved, my baby. That's why I sing the blues. I wrote that song when I was 15. It was about my first love and every love that follows. You see, at 15, I decided that the things that made me different made me difficult. And to be difficult is to be unlovable. Ugly means to be troublesome, quarrelsome. Of course, the opposite being beauty, pleasurable. In a room full of women, I'm sure this resonates for some. So today, I'm going to encourage you to resist your urge to redefine beauty and instead lean into your ugly. <laughs> yeah, I heard some, yeah. Because leaning into your ugly can lead you to a life of more authenticity as well as create a space for others to live in vulnerability. Funny enough for me, my whole conversation about leaning into ugly started with a talk with a model, but we'll get to that. So you don't know you're different until someone tells you you're different. And for me, I remember that exact moment. I had a neighbor growing up named Nicole. I loved playing with Nicole because she had Barbies. Barbies upon Barbies, and they had these big blue eyes and red mouths and permanent smiles. Don't get me wrong, I much preferred my Ninja Turtles and Hot Wheels, but they, I got something with working or playing with Nicole. It was affirmation. It was an affirmation I couldn't understand, but I longed for. So one day, playing at Nicole's house, I asked her mother if my brother can come play with us. My brother didn't do as well socially as I did. The sting of unbelonging had never reached my skin, and I didn't understand what his experience was. To be more honest, I didn't understand what his problem was. So Nicole's mother responded to me quickly and in a hiss. No, I'm not your babysitter. The sting of her words were felt as a strangle and it was the first time I remember experiencing what I can now articulate to be as anxiety. I knew there was something behind her words, but I didn't understand the weight of it. So I asked my friend Nicole, my good friend Nicole, my dear friend Nicole, to explain what did her mother mean. Nicole, my dear friend Nicole, my good friend Nicole, responded by looking down moving from foot to foot, as if also trying to balance this new weight that had developed between us, a weight that neither of us had the immaturity to bear. And she said, don't tell anyone. But my family doesn't like your family because you're brown. Now this weight, the weight of her words, I understood. I knew my family was brown. I just didn't realize till that moment that I was brown too. See, I'm lighter skinned than the rest of my family with curious green eyes. And I say curious because no one else in my immediate family has green eyes. My mother would constantly be stopped by people in the grocery store and at the park, and she was thought to be my nanny. And when they found out that she wasn't, they would ask if my father was white, and her response being a tiny, five feet of fury was, no, but the mailman is. <laughs> Mortifying. So, I left Nicole's after that. I walked the 20 tiny steps to my house, and I never came back. And as time passed, my skin held the sun like a memory as I got browner, while Nicole sought the shade. Troll dolls became my new favorite toy. They were small and brown and ugly, just like me. We moved away later that summer with no goodbyes. Now, this is the time I started really noticing women, and not in a creepy way, <laughs> thinking that. Not the way they looked or the way they dressed, but the way they handled conflict or didn't. I would see faces change and words contained, like a Barbie. 
I realized that to be successful, to be a successful woman, especially a successful woman of color, was to edit yourself. There's a term, tone policing. It's when you're criticized not for what you said, but how you said it. I'm sure you've all heard it before. You get more bees with honey than with salt. But what does that mean? And what that means for me is that there is no room in a woman's kitchen for anger. So by the time I was 22, when I met the model, I was living a charmed life. I dreamed someone else's dream, and I got it. The Barbie dream house, fully furnished with my own Ken. But like sticking a troll doll into a Barbie Corvette, it was uh, awkward. <laughs> and although I could get from point A to point B, the journey was going to be strange. And I think an awkward, strange journey is a good metaphor for the LGBTQ experience. We, LGBTQ people, are sold a line, and that line, I'm sure you've heard it is, it gets better, right? To stick it out, kiddo, and it gets better, you'll find your place in the rainbow. And for some, it gets great, and that's fantastic, but for others, there are consequences to breaking open our, our veneer in a world that's not ready. Considering 21% of youth who are homeless identify as LGBTQ, the fear is real. And again, that 21% is a very, very modest statistic. Lesbians, like families who are lesbians, two women talked about income inequality. Families who are lesbians and um, transgender people make up a very large demographic of those who are underneath the poverty line. Now, it is no coincidence to me that the people who would have the most challenge in accessing the social standards of beauty or those who reject the social standards of beauty would be punished economically. So, enter the opposite, the model. I met the model when I was working at an NGO. Sam was her name, and she was diplomatic, kind, soft. She was all these things I aspired to be. So even though she was hired as my assistant, I was intimidated. I didn't feel that I measured up. Quite literally, I'm 5'1", five 5'1 one, five one and a half, holding on to that half like Napoleon. Um, that's actually what she would call me. That was her nickname for me. I'd ask her to file something. She's like, okay, Napoleon. She was a fantastic statuesque 6'2". So the, the bar was high. And she was interested in me too. And she'd ask me questions about my work. So we were having a conversation one day about a workers' cooperative I helped establish in India. And she asked me the question, why? Why do the work? Why do these things happen? Now, most people, I think, know not to ask an activist why anything. Let me tell you a little bit about us. We're always like picking through the conversations, waiting to tell you about something we care about. So no matter how hard I tried to you know, balance out or sand down those ugly edges of myself, they would come out in spurts of energy that were deemed aggressive or ambitious. So I couldn't contain it, and I let out this rant about globalization, neoliberalism, gender inequality, and on and on and on. And Sam, eyes like Barbie, just widened. Now, you know that face? That face? No. That face? <laughs> I get that face a lot. Single forever, yeah. Um, so she got that face. When someone's eyes glaze over and you know now what stands between you is you and an ocean. And I thought for sure she must be adrift as anyone would be if you had someone at a light tower screaming at you, pushing you further and further away from the shore with their words. But instead, she blinked. She blinked her big blue eyes and she said, hearing you speak makes me realize that I haven't cared about anything, ever. And Sam blinked her big blue eyes and split the ocean between us into streams. She admired me. I was born lucky, for I was born with purpose. And coming screaming into this world with a cause, for an Aries, 
Yeah, someone knows astrology. For a fire sign, ruler of Mars, god of war, is like being dealt a straight flush. No pun intended. Okay. So it was around this time I decided that this is all I ever wanted to do, which was encourage people to embrace the parts of themselves that they were told to be shameful about, that they were told it was ugly. For LGBTQ people, that's your gender identity, that's your sexual orientation. For folks of color, that's our skin color, our complexion, our heritage. And for women, it's your passion. Unleasing your passion. So, well, as if um, an overachiever, I tend to, to go on 100, even if it is a cliche. So I don't know if any of you know this joke, what do lesbians do on their second date? U-Haul, move in. So I didn't just U-Haul, I U-Hauled to Amsterdam. Yeah, and so fast forward, because I wasn't moving fast enough, to 2012, when I got that chance. I got that chance to help people embrace these parts of themselves by becoming a coordinator of an LGBTQ community center. And this was everything I ever wanted. So you know when someone says, this is everything I have ever wanted, that means it's going to be wah, wah, wah. <laughs> My days were 15 hours long at minimum with no organization, no resources, and so on, and so on, and so on. And me as a worker, I had no capacity. Now, you never would have known this because I worked very hard to uphold this veneer as if there was nothing wrong. I want you to think of how you feel about your own work and how you feel about yourself. Now, the imposter syndrome is this feeling that you can't internalize your own accomplishments. You're not worthy of your accomplishments, and you have a sense of anxiety for people finding out. So that keeps us from exposing the things that we need. This is what I was thought to be as um, when I was in my most stressful time without any capacity. If you've asked yourself, who am I? For me, the answer is, I am an elf. Very close to a troll. So. I would ask you now, as my time is running out, to just imagine quickly of your capacity as a jacket with buttons. Right? This is an invisible jacket that you wear throughout your life. Now think of each insult that really hurts you. Each rejection, each heartbreak is a thread pulled from one of these buttons. And each assault, each trauma, each huge act of violence is a button ripped clean off. Now, we wear these jackets throughout our lives. Sometimes it's sunny, it's doing all right. Sometimes it's raining, not so much. And sometimes it's storming. And we all know when it's storming in your life and you are going through without any buttons, you're doing everything you possibly can to hold yourself together. And when you go through the storm, it is hard and it is cold and it is lonely. But it gets so much harder and so much colder and so much lonelier when you have people looking on wondering, with all their buttons intact, I can get through this. Why can't you? And that's what it looks like when you're going through a crisis and holding up a veneer. Or I should say, that's what it looks like. Oh no, I'm wet. And that's what it feels like. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Social work teachers, and motherhood are the only professions in which you are expected to eat, breathe, and pay your bills on passion alone. Right? Preach. And that's what ended up happening for me as without any notice, the agency ended. No notice for me as a worker, and no notice for the clients. So I did the only thing I could possibly think to do, which is just keep going. For months, I acted as if I still had an income, but I didn't. So I kept going and going throughout the storm, holding close my jacket, not telling anyone, as the uh, demand just rose and rose and rose, and people getting frustrated, thinking, why are you dropping the ball? So I had to make a decision at that point. It was fight, which is get defensive and mad at people for needing things. Not a good option. Flight, quit altogether. I did one night in desperation Google how to resign being gay. I got re the rabbit hole of the internet. It's not good. 
Or the third option, to ride the wave till you see land and swim to shore. So I chose that option. That option made breaking open. That meant telling people what I needed. And the response to that kind of vulnerability, which is very hard to do when you are afraid that people are going to see you as incapable, the response to that was an outpour of resources. Resources of getting an office for free, people power, funding, collective gasp. Yeah. So within six months of this agency closing, there was another organization. Huzzah! Now, I learned a few things in this process to make me a better social worker, a better community organizer, and a better educator, but more than anything else, to make me a better person. These practices have helped me communicate with people when my self-critic has whispered to me, go it alone. Share your capacity. Share your capacity right away. Let people know where you're at. This helps mitigate disappointment, as well as it allows you to take stock of what you are able to provide for people. Don't treat people as you like to be treated. Treat others as they wish to be treated. And the only way to do that is by asking. Build value in your community. We need to know each other as people. We're not just worker bees. Next, trust other people's abilities. This is hard to do sometimes, but with it's possible. <laughs> I'm running out of time. All right, I'm out of time. Be malleable in your vision. Now, all of that is about this thing. If you can do this, then, then we're good. With more visions means more revisions. But a tenant to feminism is process over production. It may take a while, but we're going to get there together. Which brings us back to our invisible jacket. I see you. I see you. Which brings us back to our invisible jacket. The beautiful thing about being part of a community, whether that's a community of women, people of color, LGBTQ, a neighborhood, is that we have the opportunity to connect. I like to think of myself and my communities as a mender. I see your broken bones and I offer you a thread, seamlessly as I am mended by those around me. The pressure it takes to create and then maintain these veneers keeps us from living authentically. I've learned through this process that it is not only possible to be authentic in my private life, life, but also in my professional life. But in order to do any of this, we need to get naked. And have you noticed, troll dolls are always naked. Thank you.